to uh, my Corona home office and uh, welcome to this small presentation of the book uh, Migrants Attitudes and the Welfare State. Um, for at least a decade it has been discussed whether it was possible to combine having a fairly large and generous uh, welfare state as for example the Danish and at the same time having a, a fairly high inflow of uh, migrants. Uh, this is a discussion with many uh, nuances and um, ways of analyzing it. Uh, but one of the missing elements has been that we did not actually know much about what do the migrants themselves actually think about these welfare states that they have uh, entered. And this is basically what is provided in the book uh, that you see somewhere here around, if I can put in a picture. Um, um, based on the case of uh, Denmark. Um, the book is based on um, re representative samples of uh, migrants. Um, and normally this is not so easily done. There might be language issues around and uh, we have uh, the problem with large uh, dropouts of uh, migrants not responding. And this always make uh, survey research among migrants a little bit uh, uh, troubled by the fact that it could be the most integrated assimilated migrants who answered our uh, surveys. The nice thing about our data material is that the migrants have been drawn from the Danish uh, register, um, which means that we also have a lot of information about the migrants who did not uh, answer our uh, surveys. So we are able to, uh, through weightening procedures, to make representative samples of uh, migrants uh, in, um, in, in our material. It turns out, by the way, that it is not so necessarily. Uh, actually, uh, we did not, even though we control for having citizenship, education, income, length of time in the country, etc., we do not find that uh, working with weighted data actually give us as um, very different results than working with unweighted uh, data, which is nice to know also for our colleagues working on uh, surveys where they do not have the same possibility to control for what kind of migrants are actually in the survey. Uh, we designed uh, the project so that we have migrants coming from very different backgrounds. And uh, I will just uh, show you the, on this map what kind of uh, migrants we have. In, in, in the book, uh, we have migrants living permanently in Denmark. Um, we have migrants uh, from, uh, from, from the US. We have migrants from Russia. We have migrants from China. We have migrants from Japan. We have migrants from the Philippines. We have migrants from Pakistan. We have migrants from Iraq. We have migrants from Turkey. We have migrants from Romania, from ex Yugoslavia, from Poland, from UK and from uh, Spain. So we make the argument that we have a group of most uh, different um, migrants. They are different in terms of um, religion, culture, uh, all these uh, things in the country uh, of uh, origin. Uh, and also different, they have differences in the position that they have in Denmark. Uh, for instance, in terms of uh, positions on the labor market, uh, and through these Danish registers, we also have detailed knowledge about how much tax do they pay in Denmark and how much benefit do they get uh, from the Danish welfare state. And some of these groups, for instance, uh, the Americans living in Denmark, they are net contributors to the Danish welfare state, by no doubt. And uh, that also is the case for the, for the Polish migrants, whereas other groups uh, are, uh, uh, are benefiting more from the Danish welfare state than they uh, contribute. So we have a variety, a variation in terms of economic positions, and let's call it self-interest in the Danish uh, welfare state. Uh, what we argue is that they also have something in common, and what they have in common is that they have all made a move, uh, so they have migrated, and uh, this experience of being a migrant, uh, do they have uh, in common? Uh, as the first thing. And the other second thing is that what they're having in common is that they have tried to live in this little country up north 
uh, called uh, Denmark. And we build the theoretical argument. Um, first, the experience of being a migrant from migration studies. Um, we adapt the argument that the attitudes and values and norms of migrants are actually very flexible. It is not so that you enter with a set of attitudes and they are stable uh, through uh, the rest of your life uh, in the country of um, a destination. On the contrary, we know from Barry and all other uh, previous researchers that there's a, psychologically there's a process of acculturation with a Barry's term uh, taking place. Um, and what we have here is uh, first generation migrants. Uh, coming into uh, Denmark. They are flexible. The second experience that they have, the experience of living in Denmark, um, there we theorize that based on a large literature on uh, how, from the comparative welfare state literature, there's a large literature on how different welfare institutions actually shape attitudes or have a feedback on attitudes. So the argument is that living in the US shape attitudes of Americans into having particular views on the welfare state as goes um, for living in Germany or living in Denmark. So in combination, we expect that these feedbacks from the institutional settings that they're in will also have an influence on migrants. And at the same time, they have fairly flexible attitudes. So we, ex we expect uh, to see assimilation. For the research question, we pose like two inter interlinked questions. The first is, do migrants actually assimilate to uh, uh, the welfare attitudes of natives? And the second, if this is the case, what are the mechanisms behind this level uh, or this uh, assimilation uh, process? Um, we have three different indicators. Uh, of, uh, of signs of assimilations uh, uh, could have taken place. Uh, the first is if there's a large gap between what those in the country of origin think about the welfare state and those uh, migrants living in Denmark of the same country of origin, what they think. And I'll show you in a minute, but if there's a large gap between, for instance, uh, those from uh, Spain living in Denmark and uh, what uh, people in Spain in general think, then this could be an indication of something happened uh, to those uh, migrating. And this is actually not bulletproof evidence because it might be a special group that migrate, which is already in the migration literature that this is often the case. But in research interlinked to this book, we also try to match uh, some of these persons uh, a little bit more carefully. So uh, we use the Americans, so trying to find the American living in Denmark to uh, match to, a to the same, so to speak, American living in the US, uh, keeping almost everything else constant. We still f see that they have different attitudes to the welfare state, that those living in Denmark, they are more positive than those living in uh, the US. So this is our first indicator. The second indicator is uh, the classic indicator that if the migrants, uh, migrants in general, uh, have attitudes that is close to those of native Danes, well, this could also be a process of assimilation. And this is naturally, uh, it has been up for discussion whether natives should be used as a yardstick uh, for, um, or the end goal, one could even say, for uh, comparison. And um, we definitely don't think this is uh, should be the goal, but we take the pragmatic position that uh, the majorities uh, are native still. So if migrants have more or less the same attitudes, well, then they are close to what majorities living in this society uh, think. Um, our third indicator is maybe where the book is uh, strongest, that is, that if we see very little difference between these very different groups of migrants, then this could also be uh, an uh, indication of assimilation uh, processes uh, taking place. Um, so I'll just show you this example um, on uh, institutional. Um, this is on this is a measurement about whether uh, people think 
uh, or an, a native thinks or a different group of migrants uh, think that politicians they are involved in corruption uh, and uh, this is on a scale from zero to hundred and uh, hundred would mean that everybody answered that almost all politicians were involved in corruption and zero would say that um, everybody uh, said that none was involved in uh, corruption and as you see here uh, the Danes themselves they uh, are uh, uh, they have a very uh, low perception of corruption in Denmark and and we 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 spend some time on this issue because uh, there's a theoretical argument that having trust in state institutions is the first precondition for establishing uh, a fairly large uh, welfare state. Um, so let's have a look at this. Um, the, the, the light gray is, um, bars indicate um, the perception in the country of origin. So for instance, um, um, residents in Spain, they are much more inclined to think that the, there are uh, corruption among uh, politicians. Um, they have an average around uh, 80, which would mean that most would say that almost uh, um, uh, quite a lot was involved in uh, corruption. Where, and if we look at those from Spain living in Denmark, it's very few uh, saying uh, that um, politicians are involved in corruption. So this gap is, so to speak, our first indication of an assimilation um, process. The second one is that we can compare this level among Danes to the level among uh, different migrant groups um, here. Uh, and what you'll see is that there are actually not that big a difference, which um, is an indication of assimilation. And the third and final indicator is that Looking across the groups of migrants, uh, we also find only moderate um, uh, moderate differences. Actually, what we find is that migrants from, from China and Spain, they are uh, perceiving a little less uh, corruption in Denmark than, for instance, um, uh, migrants from uh, Poland. And for the migrants, we can control for the level of religiosity, self-interest in the welfare state, the education, and so on. And when we do that throughout the book, uh, we still find, uh, sometimes we find differences, but in generally we find uh, only uh, minor of these uh, differences, which again is an indicator of uh, assimilation, uh, one could say. And this finding, by the way, is not particularly new. It is a standard finding from the American literature that Mexicans entering the US, they tend to have high, very high trust in American institutions, uh, at least uh, in the beginning. Um, in the book, uh, we cover different aspects. Um, we have uh, one part where we go through the theoretical arguments. We have a part where we establish that these are, in fact, very uh, different migrant groups. Uh, and then we have the part where we look at more specifically at these uh, welfare attitudes. We start out with this institutional trust. Then we have a chapter on whether it should be a state responsibility ability to take care of, uh, for instance, health care and pensions and so on. And um, we have a chapter on support for redistribution, where we, for instance, have the finding that uh, migrants, they are more willing to redistribute than Danes. Um, in general, uh, ask about support for, for the most deviant group, poor people, uh, long term unemployed, um, we have a little bit of the opposite uh, finding. Um, then we move on to attitudes towards uh, female employment and childcare, which is an integrated part of the way of living in a Nordic welfare state, because most uh, small children also is uh, in childcare and mothers, they are typically full-time in employment. Uh, and what do the migrants uh, think about uh, that? Uh, in generally, they, we have a finding of large differences between um, the attitudes in the country of uh, origin and among migrants living in Denmark, which is an indicator of assimilation. But there we also do have some uh, differences between different groups of uh, migrants, which pinpoint or point to some kind of uh, cultural uh, legacy. And this is, by the way, not only uh, Muslim uh, female uh, groups, it's also uh, different groups of migrants, for instance, Russians uh, living in uh, Denmark. 
Um, then we have a, f uh, a fourth uh, section uh, where we uh, have um, a little bit exotic topic, maybe one could say. One is about what do migrants think about giving other migrants access uh, to the Danish welfare state, to benefits and services in Danish welfare state. And here we have the finding that migrants, they are actually a bit more willing to be open. Um, it is conditioned on whether they have citizenship and uh, the level of uh, solidarity they feel with other people from the same country of origin, which is uh, one of the few indications we have of a group self-interest maybe uh, shaping some of uh, their attitudes. Uh, then we have a chapter on horizontal trust, whether you think most of the people can be trusted. And here we have the standard finding that there is a difference, that, that, that the migrants living in Denmark have higher trust than they have in the country of origin. So that, that's again an indicator of assimilation. But we also find that there is a difference between uh, native and migrants uh, in uh, general. Um, so that's, that is a case of, let's say, none uh, non full uh, perfect assimilation. As for the difficult uh, second question about what are the mechanisms, uh, we primarily sort of built the theoretical argument um, and that is because empirically we do not have the perfect data. The perfect data would be to interview migrants before they left. So when they were in the country of origin and then when they were entered Denmark, and then a couple of times during their stay in Denmark. These data are not available, uh, so uh, it makes it difficult to make strong arguments about um, what are the uh, empirical uh, results about what are the processes actually uh, going on. But we do provide a theoretical argument. We also do have, uh, or we do try, or, or we, we, we do study what is the impact of time actually. And he, he, here we have the first generation migrants, so we cannot look about what second generation, generation migrants th think, but we, we try to estimate the importance of time living in Denmark. And what we in general find is that it does not matter so much. So maybe assimilation here takes place as at a higher pace than what one could imagine from a more cultural, generally, um, process of beginning to to feel be, become Danish. So it is maybe more of the institutional change that has an immediate immediate uh, impact on attitudes to uh, the welfare state. So the takeaway maybe to the big discussion about combining welfare states and migration, that is in my point of view that um, we do not deliver an answer, but at least it is interesting to know that migrants coming into these uh, institutional arrangements, they actually uh, tend to uh, support them uh, to same extent or even to higher extent than do natives. And it is not only a matter of self-interest because even those migrant groups who are net contributors to uh, the welfare, uh, the Danish welfare state, for example, they tend to uh, actually uh, support it uh, quite uh, a lot. So I encourage you to take a look in the book um, and to, to read the details. Uh, it is available probably in a library and hardback and it will be uh, also available uh, online uh, in open access actually after a year. Uh, three of our good colleagues, they have had a read of the book. Um, you can see uh, what they thought. Uh, one is from uh, Ben van uh, one is uh, from Nils Holtuk, and one is from uh, Keith uh, Banting. And uh, at least uh, they, they were happy about uh, some of the uh, content. So have a look and uh, hope to meet you in real life uh, at a conference. Uh, um, both me and my uh, colleagues, we uh, hope you will enjoy uh, reading uh, the book. So thank you very much. Bye bye.